Dialectic of Defeat, Contours of Western Marxism by Russell Jacoby, Chapter 5, The Subterranean Years. In the mid-1920s, the story breaks off and up into, up into separate pieces and chapters. Stalinism as a world phenomenon, the onset of fascism, World War II, and the Cold War more than sufficed to repress or frighten into silence unorthodox Marxists. Yet a Western Marxism did not evaporate. Its paths can be followed through these decades until the late 1950s when it reemerged, again political and public. The scattering and decentralization of Western Marxism lends an arbitrariness to the examination of particular individuals or groups. In Italy, France, Germany, and elsewhere, groups and grouplets, traditions and currents persisted that finally coalesced into a viable, if unsuccessful, alternative to Soviet and, un and Orthodox Marxism. <clears throat> the fate of Western Marxism in Italy requires some additional comments. In surveying the development of Western Marxism, simple patterns are seductive. If these fail, the opposite approach is equally tempting to find only special cases and to arrive at no general conclusions. In many respects, Italy was a special case, at least in regard to the roots and impact of Western Marxism. Nowhere else did the Western Marxists, the Frankfurt School or Panacoak and Gorder, or Marlowe, Ponty and Sartre participate in the mainstream of Marxism. Yet Italian Marxism incorporated Antonio Gramsci the resiliency and the independence of Italian communism in the current period is partly due to this fact or accident. The process by which Gramsci became anointed an official <clears throat> has provoked endless controversy. To some, it entailed the domestication of Gramsci, a falsification of his thought. The opponent of official Marxism is palmed off as the exponent. Yet Italian Marxism is shaped by more than a trick. It bears the scars of the political conflict between Gramsci and Amadeo Bordiga. By virtue of his roots in Italian Hegelianism, his advocacy of factory councils, his analysis of intellectuals and culture, and his critique of mechanical Marxism, Gramsci is deemed a prime adherent of Western Marxism. For instance, in a neat case of theoretical symmetry, Lucas and Gramsci dissected in similar terms Nikolai Bukharin's historical materialism, once a basic text of Soviet Marxism. Yet Gramsci did not become a pariah, the fate of Lucas or Korch, but, the the, but the effective leader of the Italian Communist Party and spokesman for the common turn. Bordiga has attracted less interest, especially outside Italy, but he became the dissident and opponent of the common turn. Lenin identified Bordiga, not Gramsci, as the left communist. Narrow links bind Bordiga to the other left communists, however. They derived from a rejection of parliamentary tactics, but did not extend to a theory of organization. For Bordiga and his abstentionism, or boycottists, parliamentarism smacked of reformism and opportunism. His repudiation of elections, however, was based in a rigorous and disciplined party, not, as with other left communists, in authoritarian proletarian organizations. Bordiga represented obdurate Leninism. We favor the strong and centralized Marxist political party that Lenin speaks of. Indeed, we are the most fervent supporters of this idea. Left communism then encompassed widely divergent positions. Unlike other left communists, Bordiga, consistent with his inflexible Leninism, vigorously opposed factory councils. For Bordiga, the councils, by shifting struggles to the economic units, minimized the decisive importance of forming the Leninist political party. Some of the mystery of Italian Marxism stemmed from this constellation of programs. Gramsci not only finally gained the upper hand in the Communist Party, but championed factory councils. To be sure, Gramsci did not always defend the councils, and when, and if, and how much, 
he renounced them forms part of the Gramsci controversy. The relationship of Bordiga and his followers to the wider European left communism can be illustrated by his journal Il Soviet. Like co communismists, it served as a forum for left communists, publishing Panacoke, Lucas, Pankhurst, and others. In this sense, there was solidarity and agreement within a European left communism. Yet Bordiga did not hide his differences with the other left communists on organization. This is clear, for example, from his comments on the formation of the German Communist Workers' Party, the KAPD. Bordiga sympathized with the German Communist Party, the KPD, Central Committee, not the split of the left communist KAPD. Although Bordiga concurred with some of the tenets of the KAPD, he nevertheless saw it through Leninist glasses as, as a syndicalist deviation. If his group and the KAPD agreed on abstentionism from elections, their abstentionism differed from ours. Bordiga's position can be crystallized by examining Il Soviet in regard to Lucas's question of parliamentarianism discussed in the previous chapter. In this resolutely left communist essay, which had provoked Lenin's ire, Lucas wrote off the terrain of parliamentary politics as exclusively bourgeois and only defensive for the proletariat. Il Soviet serialized this essay and noted that this translation from communismus constitutes an extremely valuable contribution to the questions of parliamentarianism and corresponds in the greatest degree to our position. The last part of Lucas's essay, however, developed the notion of workers' councils as the true index of the proletarian revolution. Their mere existence points the way forward beyond bourgeois society. For Lucas, councils served as the authentic field of proletarian activity. In reaching this part of the ster serialization, Bordiga and the editors had a change of heart. The serialization closed with another editorial note, this time qualifying that this interesting study corresponds only in part to our view. We do not accept, in fact, the considerations in the last part for reasons which would be superfluous to repeat. Nevertheless, the narrow links between Bordiga and the other left communists cannot be dismissed. It is hardly fortuitous that Bordiga was driven into the opposition. Bordiga challenged Soviet Marxism more openly, if less profoundly, than did Gramsci, and the critique that Bordiga mounted shared many features with Western Marxism. In the en enlarged executive of the Common Turn in 1926, Bordiga did not mince words. He said that the Russian model of revolution lacked universal applicability. The stable bourgeois state apparatus of the West was unknown in Russian history. Bordiga's heresy was quickly answered. Bukharin indicated its roots. We have heard similar objections in 1921 from the renegade Paul Levi, who continually, continually maintained that we mechanically transferred the Russian experience onto Western Europe. The complexity of Italian Marxism was such that Bordiga became the opponent and Gramsci, at least nominally, the defender of the common turn. Against Gramsci, Bordiga argued that a crisis in the common turn existed, as well as a fundamental defect in the internal method of work. Unlike Gramsci, Bordiga rejected the slogan in reality of Bolshevization. It signifies an artificial and mechanical transposition to the Western parties of methods which were specific to the Russian party. With Bolshevization, an attempt is being made to resolve questions which are political with formulae of an organizational character. In the enlarged executive, he denounced the regime of terror conducted against common turn opponents. This mania of self-destruction must stop. In France, as discussed previously, the late development of Western Marxism corresponded to the lateness of an indigenous Hegelian literature. Once this literature was established, the works of Maurice Merleau-Ponty and Jean-Paul Sartre retrieved and invigorated a Western Marxism in the post-World War II years. Merleau-Ponty's Sense and Nonsense, 1948, and Adventures of the Dialectic, 1955, and Sartre's Materialism and Revolution, 1946, and to a lesser extent, 
his Being and Nothingness, 1943, as well as their journal, Les Temps Modernes, signified a vital French Western Marxism. Other eddies of Western Marxism surfaced, notably around the journals Socialisme ou Barbarie, 1949 to 1965, and Arguments, 1956 to 1962. The former served as the vehicle for writings of Claude Lafaud and Cornelius Castoriadis, and the latter for Henry Lefebvre. Arguments also presented the first French translations of Lucas and Court. Lefebvre's career in France recapitulates the general development of Western Marxism. Lefebvre left the French Communist Party only after 1956, but his earlier activities and writings betrayed a commitment to unorthodox Marxism. He belonged to a group called Philosophies, which briefly, 1925 to 1926, formed an alliance with the Surrealists. With Norbert Gutermann, he translated Hegel, Lenin's Hegel notebooks, and early Marx. He also wrote with Gutermann a book that represented a high point of French Western Marxism in this earlier period, La Conscience Mystifiée. Published in 1936, the title itself hints of history in class consciousness. In many respects, it was a French history in class consciousness rewritten in the context of the struggle against fascism. Yet Lucas goes unmentioned in the text. As Lefebvre explained later, aware of the heresy of Lucas's book, he, or more precisely they, avoided references to it. One of the ideas that Lefebvre and Gutermann introduced in the book, the critique of the daily life, sustained much of Lefebvre's, Lefebvre's later work. Norbert Gutermann, through perpetually self-effacing, should not go unnoticed. He is one of few real international representatives of Western Marxism. He collaborated and translated with Lefebvre. Later in the United States, he worked with the Frankfurt School. He wrote with Leo Lowenthal of the Frankfurt School, Prophets of Deceit, 1949, a volume in a series edited by Max Horkheimer. By its impact, productivity, and originality, the Frankfurt School, including Max Horkheimer, T.W. Adorno, and Herbert Marcuse, belongs in the first ranks of Western Marxism. Although frequently derided as isolated and ineffectual in its exile, one of the very few seminal American contributions to Western Marxism, Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy's Monopoly Capital, 1966, bears its imprint. The heresy of monopoly capital is often missed, and its links to Western Marxism are usually ignored. To the conventional Marxist concept of surplus value, Baran and Sweezy added that of surplus. This was not a minor revision. It appended a critical, almost a moral dimension to an, an economic concept, and it allowed them to discuss features of everyday life, sexuality, modes of consumption, and so on, that escaped a flat economic approach. Surplus sought to register the difference between the present arrangement of society and a rational one. The last chapter of Monopoly Capital, The Irrational System, resounds with moral denunciation. The concept itself derived from Baran's earlier Political Economy of Growth, 1957, where it was rooted in Horkheimer's concept of objective reason. Baran had studied in Frankfurt and had remained close to Marcuse and Lowenthal. According to Sweezy, Baran was profoundly and permanently influenced by his Frankfurt association. In any case, the ties between the Frankfurt School and Western Marxism do not need belaboring. The Frankfurt School refers to the Institute of Social Research in Frankfurt, where Max Horkheimer brought together a series of original and incisive thinkers. The institute itself was designed to promote an independent Marxism equally distant or close to academic specialization and party imperatives. Much of its inspiration, as well as its financial backing, came from Felix Weil. A net of personal and political relationships centering on Weil bound together the figures of Western Marxism and the Frankfurt School. In 1921, Korch published a volume by Whale. Some years later, Korch was charged with forming with Whale and Boris Roninger, a dissident faction within the Communist Party. 
In 1922, Whale convoked a Marxist study group in which both Korch and Lucas participated, as well as others who played a role in the Frankfurt School, Frederick Pollock and Karl Wittfogel. At the same time, discussions proceeded among Whale, Pollock, and Max Horkheimer on the possibility of founding an institute to study Marxism that would be affiliated it, affiliated to university, but freed from the usual academic pressures. With caution or foresight, the projection, the projected name of Institute of Marxism was scrapped for the more acceptable Institute of Social Research. Financial backing by Will's father enabled the Institute to open in 1924 as an affiliate of Frankfurt University. After the tenure of Karl Grunberg, Max Horkheimer became the director in 1931 and commenced Zeitschrift für Sozialforschung, <laughs> 1932 to 1941. Its last two volumes were titled Studies in Philosophy and Social Science. The chapters of the Frankfurt School span too many decades and include too many people and projects to summarize here. Yet the frequent charge that it betrayed Marxism by fleeing politics is historically blind. It was in flight, but from Nazism. The participants of the Frankfurt School were scattering almost as soon as they came together under Horkheimer's directorship. Among his first acts, Horkheimer established a bureau in Geneva and investigated opening other offices outside of Germany. Only months after the Nazis attained power in January 1933, the Institute was closed and its library seized. Horkheimer, Pollock, and Marcuse had already left. The second volume of their journal was published in exile in Paris. If their flight from Nazism is obvious, it is often ignored in evaluating the politics of the Frankfurt School. For independent left-wing exiles, the possibilities of political intervention, already, already checked by Stalinization, further diminished. Nor are the charges that the Frankfurt School failed to develop a theory or organization, if not a practical politics, to the point. These charges succumb to the bewitchment of words. Out of a theory of a proletarian organization springs a revolutionary organization. Nothing is more scholastic than disputes on the correct line of the proletariat when the proletariat has been silenced. To be sure, references to Nazism cannot answer all questions of the Frankfurt School's relationship to political parties and organizations. It would be difficult to argue, for instance, that before 1933, Adorno's thought tended toward a practical political idiom and that Nazi Nazism blocked, blocked this development. Without exile and fascism, however, the trajectory of Horkheimer's or Marcuse's thought might have been very different. Suggestions of the political dimension of their work are not difficult to uncover. The imperatives of exile dictated that the politics be expressed covertly until the 1960s when Marcuse emerged as a public and political thinker. That Horkheimer's most forthright political sentiments were published under a pseudonym or in privately circulated manuscripts testified to the fragility of his situation. In 1934, he published Demerung, a collection of notes and aphorisms under the name Heinrich Regius. The first sen sentence summarized it succinctly. This book is obsolete. He explained that problems like that of the cultural politics of the social democrats, bourgeois literature which sympathizes with the revolution, the academic presentation of Marxism formed an intellectual world which has now disappeared. Horkheimer sharply attacked in Dimmerung bourgeois intellectuals and sympathizers to socialism. He remarked that when literary radicals bemoaned that capitalism has stabilized, they were never as downcast as when they related some personal misfortune. If they are knowledgeable about revolutionary theory, they lack expertise in questions relating to the time revolution will break out. This time depends upon the will of men, but that is not the same in one who leads the life of the intellect and one to whom everything is denied. Several pas passages read as defenses of the Communist Party. However, 
inadequate of revolutionary leadership, it does not negate the fact that it is the head of the struggle. Criticism of this leadership from the outside is unacceptable. It fails to grasp the real options. Bourgeois criticism of the proletarian struggle is a logical impossibility. The revolutionary career is not a series of banquets and a string of honorific titles, nor does it hold the promise of interesting research or professor's salaries. Wrote Professor Horkheimer. Yet Demerang was hardly an advertisement for the Communist Party, and Horkheimer attacked a note to this passage, or attached a note to this passage, observing the disjun disjunction between proletarian leadership and moral character. He resolved this only by questions. Does the higher level of the bourgeois critics, their more acute moral sensibility, not in part result from the fact that they keep away from the real political fight? Do the better educated have any good reason to damn those who are actually involved in this struggle? Another section expanded on the fateful dis disjunction between the political imperatives and human preconditions of socialism. In a passage entitled The Impotence of the German Working Class, Horkheimer put some of his theoretical cards on the table. The capitalist process of production has thus driven a wedge between the interest in socialism and the human qualities necessary to its implementation. That is the new element. These devolved on a separate group. These, dis dis these devolved on separate groups and parties. The Communist Party and the Social Democrats no longer combined both. The Communist Party relied on authority and the Social Democrats renounced Marxism. The wedge fatally wounded Marxist theory. Loyalty to materialist doctrine threatens to become a mindless and contentless cult of literalism and personality unless a radical turn soon occurs. At the same time, the materialist content, which means knowledge of the real world, is the possession of those who have become disloyal to Marxism. It is therefore also about to lose its only distinguishing characteristic its existence and as knowledge. These reflections define the Frankfurt School for the next decades. Marxists without a party or a proletariat faced a party and a proletariat without Marxism. Neither an act of will nor theoretical brilliance escaped this dilemma, and the situation did not improve. Horkheimer's next and most political writings belong to the darkest period of World War II. The authoritarian state, reason and self-preservation, and the Jews in Europe were written in the period 1939 to 1941. Each ex exuded the atmosphere of those years, the defeat of the Spanish Republic, the Nazi-Soviet Pact, and the fall of France. Two were published in a privately circulated volume dedicated to Walter Benjamin, who, fleeing Nazi Nazism, committed suicide in 1940. The terseness and compressed tension of these essays defy summary. They suggest, moreover, the existence of two Horkheimers. One Horkheimer directed the Institute of Social Research, writing prefaces and broad programmatic essays on critical theory. He worked to establish the academic legitimacy of a Western Marxism. The other Horkheimer occasionally took off his tie to use the direct language of libertarian communism. Reason and Self-Preservation and The End of Reason closed with words that Rosa Luxemburg made famous. The progress of reason that leads to its self-destruction has come to an end. There's nothing left but barbarism or freedom. No, microscopic, or no microscope is necessary to find the links to a left communism in the authoritarian state. Horkheimer expressly appealed to the tradition of workers' councils. The often cited political immaturity of the masses behind which party bureaucrats like to hide is in reality nothing but skepticism towards the leadership. The workers have learned that they have nothing to expect from those who called them out from time to time, only to send them home again, but more of the same, even after a victory. The theoretical conception which, following its first trailblazers, will show the new society its way. The system of workers' councils grows out of praxis. The roots of the council system go back to 1871, 1905, and other events. 
revolutionary transformation has a tradition that must continue. The authoritarian state, although hardly addressed, addressed to the proletariat, was permeated by Western Marxism and left communism. Horkheimer treated the party itself as a deadening bureaucratic structure. The large working class organizations imitated the states they were combating. Like the captains of industry, the working class leaders used the purse and sometimes force to eliminate internal opposition. They kept the masses under strict discipline and tolerated spontaneity only when pre-planned. They sought not the democracy of councils, but work discipline and order. Like Lucas, Horkheimer criticized the evolutionary interpretation of socialism. The laws of capitalism do not guarantee socialism or freedom. The idea of Marxists as the midwives of history simply attending its natural course degraded revolution to mere progress of the existing society. Rather, the break in history rests on the actions of the subject that cannot be totally commanded. The Authoritarian State was published with Walter Benjamin's Theses on the Philosophy of History. Benjamin also wrote of the leap out of history. The prognosis, however, was bleak. Not only freedom, explained Horkheimer, but also future forms of oppression are possible. Moreover, sociological and psychological concepts are too superficial to express what has happened to revolutionaries in the last few decades. Their will toward freedom has been damaged. The hope was dim but real. The eternal system of the authoritarian state, as terrible as the threat may seem, is no more real than the eternal harmony of the market economy. For decades, the Frankfurt School spoke to few, yet it was not simply a personal failing if their language and concepts lacked political impact. The situation of homeless German-Jewish exiles did not encourage boldness. When the conditions changed, in the late 1950s, the language of the theory also changed, most emphatically with Marcuse. His path toward politics can be charted even at its most distant point, his prefaces and postscripts to his books on Hegel. The preface to Hegel's Ontology and Ontology and die Theorie der <laughs> Geschichte <laughs> for fuck's sakes. Hegel's Ontology, the Theory of Historicity. <laughs> 1933. His first book on Hegel declared his intention of establishing fundamental principles of a historici hero historicity. Fuck. The preface to the first edition of Reason and Revolution, Hegel and the Rise of Social Theory, 1941, sought to demonstrate that Hegel's ideas were hostile to fascism. And it closed citing Hegel, American America may be the land of the future. A 1954 epilogue later dropped to reason and revolution expressed another mood. The defeat of fascism and national social socialism has not arrested the trend towards totalitarianism. Freedom is on the retreat. His 1960 preface announced, from this stage on, all thinking that does not testify to an awareness of the radical falsity of the established forms of life is not merely immortal, it is false. Oh, not merely immoral, it is false. The threat of atomic destruction, the waste of resources, mental impoverishment, and brute force define the universe of discourse and action. In this universe, dialectical thought is critical and subversive. To orthodox Marxists, the Frankfurt School remained a scandal and never severed its link to German idealism and historicism. It criticized the fetish of science. It stayed clear of proletarian organizations. It was too interested in culture, psychoanalysis, and subjectivity. And most damning of all, it lacked successes, but not pessimism. Yet pessimism is not only a personal choice or a quirk. It is drenched in a heartless past. A cheerful Marxism is already suspect. It whitewashes the past in the name of a red future. What must be recognized is that to Western Marxists and the Frankfurt School, the desperate hope of the dialectic had not been realized, nor could the pain and suffering of the past simply be added to the bill of the bourgeoisie. Marxists were implicated and sometimes responsible. The shadow that accompanies Marxism is cast by this reality. 
Late in Lucas's long career, he denounced Adorno and other Marxist intellectuals for their pessimism and distance from revolutionary organizations. He charged that they preferred to remain in what he called the Grand Hotel Abyss, a beautiful hotel where one could contemplate the void in first-class comfort. The designation has enjoyed a certain vogue. It inferred that Marxist intellectuals without a party of the proletariat lacked verve and commitment. If Lucas is allowed this denunciation, others who enthusiastically repeat it should not forget the few choices and options of the time. The risks were not only of falling in the front lines, but of liquidation in the back rooms. While Lucas survived in Moscow in the 1930s and 1940s, others were less fortunate. Even Bela Kuhn, Lucas's bitter opponent in the Hungarian party, was arrested in 1938 to denounce the refugee refugees in the Hotel Abyss without recognizing that the hotels on the street of Marxism were not only far apart, but often fire traps is to mislead the traveler. Any guide that is more than a public relations ploy must scrutinize and evaluate all the, the available accommodations. If the Hotel Abyss can symbolize Western Marxism in the 1930s and 1940s, the Hotel Lux can symbolize Soviet Marxism. Unlike the Hotel Abyss, the Lux was not a metaphor, but a hotel housing foreign communists who resided in Moscow. A detailed guidebook might mention that the Lux offered a special service. Visitors were often spared the annoyance of checking out. Many foreign communists were arrested in their rooms in the Lux. The guide might also include individuals' accounts of the accommodations. Heinz Newman, the sharp critic of Korch and Maslow, and the reliable servant of the common turn, stayed at the Lux until arrested there in 1937. His wife recalled that at the end of the search of the room, Newman told her, don't cry. The secret police, GPU, leader then ordered, that's enough, get a move on now. At the door, she remembered, Heinz turned and strode back, took me in his arms again and kissed me. Cry then, he said, there's enough to cry about. Newman never returned, along with other German communists, in one of the infamous deals of history, his wife was delivered by the Russians to the Nazis during the Soviet-Nazi pact. <laughs>